sorry, my lawyer asked for bail again. And in order to ask for another bail application, you have to prove that something has changed. So I want to talk about all the things that have changed since February, the last time I was denied bail. The first thing is the Ingram tape. My lawyer was given over a tape recording that the prosecutors hid from us for 13 years that proves that I had nothing to do with this crime and it further implicates Russo, actually. Uh, the second thing is a Cleary letter that we were just finally given over. That was written in 2006, but we just got it a few weeks ago. This letter helped Cleary with his probation or to get back into colleges. It was a benefit from the DA's office, wrote him a letter of recommendation, and they told the jury several times that he got nothing in exchange for his testimony. And the next thing is the fact that Detective Burns did perjure himself, and I now have proof. Burns says that he met John Avito at a drug program several weeks before John Avito needed anything. That's what he came to my evidentiary hearing and said. But I knew that was a lie because John Avito himself admits that he didn't call Detective Burns until after he got in trouble and he needed something. And now I have a recording of Burns being questioned and not remembering anything about seeing him in a drug program. So he got up on the stand and totally contradicted a statement that he made on tape just a few weeks before. And the last thing is the fact that Russo admitted to this crime, which shows I have nothing to do with it. So all of those things have changed since February. Yet when I went to court and my lawyer spoke about all those things and asked for bail, Judge Chun says, the only thing that has changed, if anything, and he even repeated it, he said, what, the only thing that has changed, if anything, is this letter that was written several years after Cleary testified, my lawyer corrected me, he said, no, sir, just a couple of months, it was written just a couple of months after he testified, Ron, he said, oh, okay, well, the only thing that changed, if anything, is this letter, and that's when I, I just, I was in total shock, I couldn't believe that he just totally ignored all these other things that changed including the fact that Russo admitted that he acted alone and he committed this crime. On top of that, these Ingram tapes are huge because this is something that also exculpates me. And the prosecutors totally just suppressed it from us and hid it, hid it from us for all these years, which is the epitome of prosecutorial misconduct. And that's when I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, this is wrong. This is wrong what you're doing to me. This is not right. I'm suffering, and they dragged me out. So that's actually what happened at my court date. I don't know if anybody got to read about it, but I heard it was in the newspaper. I, I heard they made it look like I flew into a rage. It's not really exactly what happened. Welcome to Crawl Space. What you just heard was a call with Rikers Island inmate John Juca. John Juca, who is no longer serving 25 years to life. His sentence was reversed, but now he is currently awaiting the new trial and the prosecution has filed a reversal of the reversal, which is tragic. And so we have three calls with John. They have to come in six minute increments when you get a call from Rikers Island. So the first one you just heard was one that was recorded by John's friend. And then this next 10, 11 minutes is our two calls with John. Apologies for us being unfamiliar with how this all works. This is the first time that we've actually called a prison or received a phone call from an inmate at a prison. And we were aware that they were six-minute calls, but we didn't realize that they, were, they would cut off so abruptly as they did. So there's a, there's a lot of information that John tries to get out, and you can tell that he's very well-versed in how to get information out in six minutes. So they're very, very interesting, and they're very quick. And so after we talk to John, we round out the episode with hearing from John's mom, Doreen Quinn Giuliano, Mother Justice, of course, who has been on this show twice before. And uh, she's really wonderful to talk to and really helps us kind of understand this legal tragedy that is ongoing. And it's really heartbreaking, too, to hear some of the 
things that she's saying, the effect that this case has had on her and her son. She has, is cites some medical issues that that's happening now, and she also puts a call out for mothers, which is really uh, a a significant call for anybody who's had something like this happen or is currently going through the same thing to band together and unite. And that is something that can be extremely powerful if it's organized. So thank you very much for listening. Check us out on Twitter at Crawl Space Pod. We're on Instagram and Facebook at Crawl Space Podcast. Thanks for listening. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. To accept charges, press 1. To refuse charges, press 2. Thank you for using Securus. You may start the conversation now. Hi, hi. How you doing? I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? No, not bad, not bad. I'm hanging in there. I, I know it's after 2 o'clock. I'm sorry I couldn't call you earlier. Yeah, no, no, not a problem at all. We're here. Uh, I'm here with Lance, and uh, actually we're uh, we're recording uh, already. We were, uh, we we're waiting for your call. Nice. Okay. Hey, John. How's it going? Hi, Lance. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, this place is such a madhouse, really. It's so totally different also than it was back when I was here in the 2004, 2005. It's a totally different world. In what really. ways? And, and it's a different world from upstate, too, you know? Yeah. What was, uh, what was the conditions like upstate? It was much more... Uh, controlled and not as chaotic and it's it's like it's one extreme or the other I feel like it's upstate there were a lot of abuses from the COs on inmates and you know it was like you could hardly ever get out of your cell and when you did like you know in Clinton at least one person was taken off of every bus and get and got beat up by the COs no kidding and that's when the pendulum was all the way to the left. Now here, the pendulum is all the way to the right, and it's like the opposite of that. It's total chaos, no control. They've lost control of the inmate population on like down. And different, I, there, there is no balance. There is no medium, you know? It's like one or the other, it seems like. Yeah, we noticed the story um, uh, from the other day that uh, a corrections officer was, was stabbed. Yeah. Yeah, that, but stuff like that happens all the time. It just doesn't get reported on, you know. Like there's so there's about 15 alarms a day in, in, in here alone, you know, Jeez. in my building alone. Some locked down. Somebody got strangled to death just last week in a couple of house, like a couple of dorms down from me. How do you keep your your nose out of trouble? I just try to, you know, stay to myself and um, you know avoid the unnecessary bullshit. Because there's unnecessary stuff in it, but then there's other stuff that's unavoidable. So the unavoidable stuff, you just have to fight, you know? That's it. How long have you been in Rikers um, so far? Since February. What was the purpose of them moving you to Rikers? So my conviction was overturned. So the 25 to life was thrown out. And so I don't have 25 to life anymore. Uh, the, that's what a reversal basically means. The conviction is overturned, and it's like you just got arrested and indicted. So you're back on, uh, in, I went from state prison to county jail. This is New York City's county jail. So it's a fight, uh, you know, either a new trial or to see how they're going to proceed with the case. So a couple of weeks ago, you were in court for a hearing and uh, y- you mentioned to the judge that uh, that you were suffering. W- was that more about Rikers, or is that just in general? It, it's both. It really is. It's just I couldn't believe that after my lawyer gave him a fifth. Okay, you, we asked for bail, and in order to, we asked for bail in February. It was denied, even though ninety oh, percent oh, of the other people I see that get reversals, especially after this much time, get granted bail. Mine was denied. But all right. We waited several months, and in order to ask for bail again, something has to have changed. Uh, several things in my case changed. Number one, my co-defendant admitted to this, doing this crime alone. So that's one. The second thing is um, they gave me a lot of evidence that they hid from me for 13 years. And we're talking about exculpatory evidence that would help to exonerate me. There's the Ingram tape. You have one minute left. And several other things. So my lawyer gave the judge a 15-minute speech about all these different things, at least four or five things that have changed since February. 
And then the judge turns around and says, well, the only thing that's changed is this letter that Mr. Cleary got. If the only, and then he repeated it again. He said, the only thing that changed, if anything, is this letter. Um, one of the, the witnesses against me got a benefit in exchange for testimony. Tes- uh, his testimony against me, his name is Albert Cleary. And I just couldn't believe that the judge just said that after we talked about four or five huge revelations. He says the only thing that changed since February is this letter. It just totally wasn't true. So I couldn't take it anymore. This is, it's been one thing after another with this judge. He used to, during my evidentiary hearing, he, he used to cut us off at the knees when my lawyer was asking people on the stand questions. And he used to say, sustained, before the DA even objected. Before they even objected, he would say, Thank you for using Securus. Goodbye. Yeah, my lawyer gave a 15-minute speech in court about four different things, specifically. One was that my co-defendant, Antonio Russo, admitted to this crime and said he acted alone. Uh, The second thing was something we call the Ingram tape. Uh, This is a guy who's trying to curry favor for himself and possibly get out of prison. And he went to them and he said something that didn't jive with their, their theory that actually helped me. So they buried it. The other two things were, one was the detective in my case, the name Thomas Burns, tried to push back the date that he went to go see a witness in my case by a couple of weeks. And the reason why he did that is because this witness was another jailhouse informant who tried to say that I told him things while we were locked up together. It wasn't true. And what he actually was doing was trying to get himself a drug program instead of going to prison. So he violated his drug program, and as soon as he needed them, he contacted them. But Detective Burns was trying to make it look like he contacted them three weeks before he violated his drug program, before he needed them for anything. And it was a total lie, and we have documents that prove that he was lying. And and they buried that also. So wouldn't that be a form of perjury? Yeah, absolutely. It is perjury. Okay. And yeah, I wrote about that on my blog, too, back in, uh, when it was happening, I was accusing him of perjury because I knew he was lying, but I had no way to prove it. But now they gave us over documents that proved everything I've been saying all along, you know, that he was lying about this. I knew he was lying about this because the prosecutors and uh, the drug counselors and even John Avito, who's a jailhouse informant, himself said that he contacted authorities when he violated the drug program and when he needed something. Detective Burns was the only one saying that he went to go, he contacted him three weeks before and he went to go see him three weeks before. But now we have documents that where Burns was interviewed and, you know, he says it right out of his own mouth that that wasn't true. How does the Brooklyn District Attorney Eric Gonzalez relate to what you're talking about now? You know, he has a chance to to rectify this injustice, and I don't understand why he's not taking that opportunity. You know, I, it's just, it's sad, but a lot of times the DAs, they'll circle the wagons for each other, and they don't want to do anything that's going to make another DA who worked in that office look bad. Also, he, he was part of the Charles Hines regime for 25 years. He worked there, so I don't know if he's really has it in him to uh, break out of that culture of corruption and, and do the right thing here. But, I, you know, I wish he did. I I don't understand why. My lawyer told me that this, this whole process is going to be a 12-month detour to settle all this stuff, and I'll be sitting in Rikers Island for that whole time. So I don't understand why... Eric Gonzalez, with, with everything that surfaced and come to light, why he wouldn't want to uh, be the hero instead of being the villain, you know? Right. Why would he want to drag all this through the mud and air out all that dirty laundry and instead of just doing the, what he knows is the right thing? So it's going right. to be another 12 months before trial? Or if there's a trial? Another 12 months before we even think about... Uh, pre-trial hearings or anything like that because uh, they got accepted to the New York State Court of Appeals and they're trying to reverse my reversal. So my you have one minute left. My conviction was overturned, but now they're trying to go to the higher... Uh, my conviction was overturned at the appellate division. They went to the high, a court, a higher level to the New York State Court of Appeals to try to get my, my uh, 
conviction that was overturned, reinstated, and me sent back to state prison. How do you stay focused? How do you prepare to? How do you prepare yourself uh, for this twelve-month detour? Uh, you know, I just I I keep trying to write as many people as possible, call as many people as possible, get my story out there, and you know, pray and just do everything I can to just try to. I I really feel like anyone who gets on this. Who, who scratches the surface of this case and researches it comes to the same conclusion. That conclusion is that I'm innocent. So I try to make it. Thank you for using Securus. Goodbye. Lance, as you know, hiring is a challenge. But there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. We are a growing business, so I totally identified that. And is this place that you speak of perfect for growing businesses? Oh, wow. Yes, it is. It's ZipRecruiter.com, and you can just put a slash crawl space on that if you want to get the most benefits out of this that you can. Oh, ZipRecruiter. That's right. We talk about ZipRecruiter a lot. It sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But guess what? They don't stop there. No. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. And you know I'm obsessed with statistics and percentages. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. It's really incredible. And with results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rating hiring site in America. And right now, as you said, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crawlspace. It's the show you're listening to. ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-A-W-L-S-P-A-C-E. ZipRecruiter.com slash crawlspace. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. So Doreen Quinn Giuliano is joining us now. Doreen, can you tell us what happened at the hearing in court a couple weeks ago? Everything got postponed once again. We asked for bail, which was denied. The judge had, Judge Chun said if the circumstances change, he will consider bail. And they did change dramatically. And he still didn't consider bail. He said, I'm going to give the prosecutors the benefit of the doubt. And in the meantime, the circumstances changed in our favor. And he still didn't give him bail. Is that unusual that the judge would give the prosecutors the benefit of the doubt? No, it's not unusual, but um, for 14 years they had the benefit of the doubt. Right. They had the benefit. So when is it ever going to be considered justice on our side? When is there ever going to be fairness on our side? Uh, the judge, you know, sitting there in the courtroom for this last hearing that we had, I was stunned. And I've come to realize that the judge really doesn't know the case. And what made me aware of that is because he was quoting the situation inaccurately. For instance, we've, uh, in discovery, John's lawyer uh, is starting to receive documents that we should have gotten back in 2005. Going through the documents, he came across a benefit letter to one of the witnesses who testified against John, and that was not disclosed back in 2005. And the benefit letter was given to the witness a few months after he testified. So he benefited from testifying, even though it was just a few months after. The letter was, to whom it may concern, this witness is... um, 
uh, is um, a shining uh, example of um, a person who did the right thing. And he um, he could take that letter anywhere and use it to get back into school because he was thrown out for um, violence. He could use it for uh, getting a job. It was a benefit letter. So we brought that to the attention of Judge Chun, and he said he disregarded the letter and said, oh, it wasn't a benefit because he got it many years later. So that tells me he, he doesn't even know the case. He got it a few months after, not many years later. And then in addition, we had received in discovery, you know, 14 years later, recordings from a second jailhouse informant, which we knew nothing about. And it was so very obvious that the judge knew nothing about it either, which it was put before him. So he didn't even speak about it. And what's happening now, we are going to the New York Court um, of Appeals, the Supreme Court of Appeals, uh, on one issue. So John's lawyer, Mark Betterall, he wants to hold that in abeyance and include all the new evidence that we've received. So that's where we stand now. We want to include the tape recording, the benefit letter, and what's extremely crucial is we uncovered that a Detective Burns lied up on the stand several times, and we can now prove it. So we want the New York State Court of Appeals to decide on all the evidence and not just one piece of it. So these are three pretty big changes that have taken place that should change the case for John and should have maybe granted him bail um, in that yeah. last hearing. So why? So that judge seems to be completely turning a blind eye to this new information. Absolutely. And then to say if the circumstances change, which they did, we found more evidence. He doesn't grant bail. And then on top of that, we are going up to the New York State Court of Appeals on only a piece of evidence. Why not include it all? Because what's going to happen is if we do not get approval to include this new evidence, then we'll just end up putting in what you call a 440, another motion, right behind this. So it's just going to be litigated for years and years, which may be their plan in the first place. It may be, well, John did 14 years, let him sit in Rikers till all this gets sorted out, and by then another four years will pass. We'll get 18 years out of him, and then maybe they'll be satisfied. Is this the same judge that has been uh, on this case since the beginning, or when did this judge, uh, Chun, come into the picture? He's a new judge. He came into the picture when Judge Maris, Alan Maris, was the trial judge and also the judge for the 440 motion on the um, juror misconduct. It goes back to the original judge, but he has since retired, so now we have a new judge and I'm telling you now, he does not read the motions. He does not know this case. Or he's turning a blind eye and pretending that all the evidence of innocence doesn't exist and he doesn't even rule on it. How could this be happening? This is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. He doesn't rule on any of the stuff that we put before him. That the prosecutors turned over 14 years later, but they turned over to the new administration they are turning over a discovery. I don't know why Eric Gonzalez is not stepping up in front of all of this and putting a stop to it. It's insanity. It's going to come to a head someday. It's going to be revealed probably around election year. It's so frustrating. I'm waiting for somebody to do the right thing and it's taking years and years off of John's life, off of my life. They're destroying us. What we uncovered about Detective Burns, 
is very serious misconduct done by this detective. I don't know. I guess maybe they're afraid that we're going to go after them to sue everybody. But this, Tim, Lance, this isn't about suing. I don't care about the money. I just want my son. I'm on my knees right now. I just want my son. Yeah, we can definitely uh, hear the frustration in your and John's voices. When John spoke to the judge in court and, and told them he was suffering, what, uh, what, what did that make you think? What does it make me feel? Yeah, what, what did that make you feel? Uh, it's tearing us apart. It's wrong. And the worst part is they all know. They all know it's wrong. And the judge knows it's wrong. The district attorney, Eric Gonzalez, knows it's wrong. The public knows it's wrong. And they continue to drag this out. Why? I I don't know. Is it pure evil? I don't want to believe that these people are evil. Do they think they're doing the right thing? I know damn well they know they're not doing the right thing. A mistake was made. And I'm looking to towards them to correct it and instead they just continue to dig this hole deeper they're hiding more evidence when i say hiding the district attorney's office they are turning it over but the judge refuses to talk about it to put it on the record for the journalist to write about it he disregards a benefit letter and says He received this letter years ago. That tells me the judge doesn't even know what he's talking about. It was a few months and it benefited the false witness. After the hearing where um, John said that he was suffering, where he told the judge that he was suffering, there was a Facebook message that was put out there where um, I believe you you were uh, expressing all of this exasperation you have for the case. And the lawyer, Mark Bedero, who just appears to be one of the one of your strongest allies, sort of put everything back on track and refocused uh, refocused you. Can you talk a little bit about Mark Bedero and how he looks like he appears to be this rock? So what Lance asked about is this interaction between Doreen and Mark Bedero, John's lawyer, on Facebook. Doreen wrote, we had a terrible day, no bail. John screamed, this is not right. They dragged John out. I scream bad words, parentheses, not ladylike, end parentheses. September, next court date, we are in a lot of pain. Mark Bedero followed up with, we did not have a terrible day. Bail wasn't going to be set today, no matter what. Keep your eye on the prize. They are on the ropes. What we saw with John was raw emotion of a despondent man who was wrongfully convicted. Good things are coming. The walls are closing in on their options. Stay focused. We have never been in a stronger position than we are now. And he ends with a little uh, muscle emoji. And Doreen went on to say, okay, Bedero, my boots are back on. Thanks for the pep talk. Back to the interview. Well, let me tell you about Mark Bettero. He has integrity. And I think this shocks the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office because they cannot believe that a lawyer is doing the right thing. (laughs) It has gotten back to us that why are you doing this? Why, first of all, why is the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office shocked that a lawyer is actually doing the right thing? Because that tells you a lot. That tells you that they expect lawyers to screw over their clients, to take their money and do the least amount of work. When this man is a bulldog, he knows that John was set up. He knows that he got a raw deal. He's fighting for justice and for what is right. And it shocks the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. He's a bulldog. You want a good lawyer, you go to Mark Betteroff. He he's got integrity. Yeah, just reading his letters that um, you know, he's written to uh the judge John Asiello. Uh he does he it's you read it and he he is a bulldog and he he's very eloquent and and articulate in his letters, especially when he debates the fact that uh Detective Burns' statements were uh classified as meritless. 
and then he follows that up with we couldn't disagree more it's just it's such a badass letter that he that he writes here Mm -hmm. but he does it in a very professional articulate and like you said he's a bulldog he has that quality to him i don't know what we would do if we didn't have mark better we've had many lawyers and i'm not saying they were bad or corrupt but for sure they didn't have what it takes he is phenomenal He's fighting for John. He believes in justice. I, on the other hand, I believe that they are corrupt. They didn't prove to me anything different. They didn't say, hey, yeah, this one lied, that one lied, this one created material to get the conviction. This whole trial was nothing but a farce. Let me correct it. No, they didn't do that. What did they do? They hid more material for 14 years. They keep fighting us and fighting us. They want to have the unanimous decision of the reversal reversed back to being a convicted felon when they know damn well he's not. So they're corrupt. What does that tell you? They're not doing the right thing. Better all believes that we will get justice. He does point out the lies and the inconsistencies. And he did a timeline that proves that John is innocent. They know this. They are very well aware of this. They don't want the public to perceive them as putting innocent people away. So they have to continue this lie. Lance, as you know, this podcast is sponsored by Shudder, the premium streaming video service from AMC Networks. Shudder's awesome. We checked out some programs that were on Shudder the other day, and it really brought us back to our youth. Shudder's irrepressible and thriving community revels in all things provocative, evocative, and dangerous. Yeah, Shudder was built to specifically super serve fans of all degrees of thrillers, suspense, and horror. So if you like horror and stuff like that, which you probably do if you're listening to us, they have the largest, fastest-growing, human-curated section of thrilling and dangerous entertainment available to stream. You can stream ad-free on all your favorite devices. And you know what? It's unexpected. There are new spine-tingling thrillers, shocking horrors, and edge-of-your-seat suspense added weekly, and it's uncluttered. Yeah, we watched Creep Show 2 here in the Crawl Space Studios just the other day, Lance, and that was a lot of fun. That was fun to go back to the to the youth. I remember watching that as a kid, and then to see it uncut without ads right there on Shutter was unbelievable. Thanks for the ride, lady. Yeah, you were talking about that part, and that was the only part you really wanted to show me, but we ended up an hour later realizing that we'd pretty much watched the entire movie Creep Show 2. So to try Shutter free for 30 days go to shutter.com slash podcast and use promo code crawl and that's shutter s-h-u-d-d-e-r again it's shutter.com slash podcast and use promo code crawl You said that there's a motion out there now to put a reversal on the reversal. What's the time frame on that? Is that just something that's done just to, just to uh, you know, bury stole people in tactic, paperwork? Yeah, maybe a stall tactic keep John in in Rikers Island for another year, squeeze him. It's it's so violent in there. Is he just gonna say I quit? You know, let me plead guilty. Maybe they'll let me go home someday. Maybe I don't know. Why would you put in, it's called a lead to appeal. They put in a request to appeal the decision of the second department. And the second department threw out the conviction and ordered a new fair trial. So they are appealing that decision and they were granted to have it closely looked at. But once we get up to the Supreme Court and we lay out, all of the misconduct, I truly believe we're going to win. But uh, it takes another year to get there. And then if we do not get an opportunity to attach the new found evidence, 
to what's already being decided on, then we have to go up the ladder with another 440 motion on the new evidence. Is the Supreme Court the sort of the final destination for this? And is that a place that, that can be seen as a fresh starting point for, for this case? A fresh starting yeah, point. Yeah, sorry. Let me, oh. let me, let me clarify that. Yeah. As in, I feel like when you describe all this, it's these, these judges who don't review the case and they don't look back at the previous judges' work on it. There's, you know, these, this ev- evidence and these recordings that keep popping up and district attorneys that seem to be stalling. Is the Supreme Court a place where all of that corruption and stalling and paperwork and red tape can just Mm -hmm. sort of be stripped away and you can have a fresh start at a new trial? First of all, I don't think there'll be a new trial. There's no evidence of that. Right now, the New York State Court of Appeals is going to decide on one piece of evidence prosecutorial misconduct, and that is what Anna Sigmund Nicolazzi did. To have a fair review of our case, they should have all the evidence before them, and that's why Mark Betterall wants to hold that in abeyance and try to get permission to have all the evidence on the record for the New York State Court of Appeals to decide on, not piecemeal. So when you say fresh start, it's it's just piecemeal that they're getting. And that could be a very long litigated case. Yeah, it's going to take years. Why does John have to sit in Rikers Island as an innocent man? Because Judge Chun doesn't know the case well. In my opinion, he doesn't know the case because he's not deciding on the evidence that we're putting before him. Now, is that his strategy? Let me not talk about it. Or is that because I'm not really reading all these letters in motion? Right. I think if he's a decent judge and he does get around to reading all this, maybe he's overwhelmed with all his cases. And let's say he is a decent judge. I think if he reads all this, he'll say, what the hell is going on here? But because of his answers, I can tell, sitting in the audience, I could tell he doesn't know the case. And that, that that's horrendous because my son pays the price. Yeah, that's a, a human life that just seems to be forgotten about. You know, once he's out of the courtroom, they move on to the next case. And that's a sad state of affairs, really. Yeah, 14 years. 14 years and you can't give him bail so he can wait in the safety of his home? No, no, it's wrong. And they all know it's wrong. And they're like mechanical. They're just mechanical. They just keep moving. Next case, next case. I mean, do they do they really see him as a flight risk? Like, why couldn't they put one of those ankle bracelets on him and have they him go can. home? We requested it. I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no. Keep going. We requested an ankle bracelet. He doesn't have a passport. We don't have family in any other countries. We don't have money like that. Where's John going? They should allow him to be home in his living room and safe. Yeah, for sure. Until they sort this all out, until they actually read all the motions. It's very scary. It's so, so scary. And I don't know why all Americans aren't scared to death, because this could happen to anybody. And it is happening to everybody. How many, every month you hear wrongfully convicted, wrongfully convicted, served 20 years, 15 years, 30 years. And why? Because they've gotten away with it for such a long time. And because of social media, it's coming to a head. Right. What do you do uh, in your day to day to keep focused on this? To keep fo- I keep reading. <laughs> I read a lot. Yeah, I read a lot, but I'm getting sick. Every day, you know, I get bad and bad migraines. I'm get it's taking a toll on us, and it's exactly what they want. They want us to get sick. I mean, Detective Burns, you have to keep in mind how these people play. 
Detective per- Burns used to tell my husband over and over again that, you know, I was cheating on him behind his back because my husband, Frank, was financing this fight. And if they get rid of Frank, then we can no longer fight without any money. And he planted the seed and it caused in-house friction. And, you know, they, they play dirty. They play really dirty. And this is what we're up against just to hold on to a wrongful conviction. They're not well, especially Detective Burns. He's not well to do this to people. What's next, Doreen? Waiting. More years of waiting. We're waiting for the decision on whether we can include the three additional pieces of evidence and attach it to the... New York State Court of Appeals motion so that the judges could decide on all of it instead of just a piece. So what's next? We wait. We wait and wait and wait. And years pass by. And before you know it, John is 40 years old, spent half his life in prison. We are going to get justice. We are. I do believe that there is somebody that's going to say this is horrendous, but it's taking lives. It's taking years off of our lives, and that's what they want. But I do think this will also fall around election year, and I'm going to fight. If I don't get justice, I am going to campaign, and I'm going to fight like hell to get a decent district attorney in Brooklyn district attorney's office. I am going to fight like hell. I just We need somebody who has integrity. Well, in the meantime, and again, we've said this before, anytime you want to come on and talk about this, even if it's just to clear your head and and just, you know, go off, it's, uh, you know, the the platform's here for you. The floor is yours. (laughs) Thank you. I know I tend to ramble and I don't, I'm not a lawyer, so I really don't know how to explain it like a lawyer. I'm, you know, I explain it the best way I know how. You you actually don't ramble at all. Yeah, yeah. And and we're not lawyers either and we, we can comprehend what you're saying. Uh so you do a great job. Oh thanks. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm just getting so frustrated and you know, and, and it like I said, it's taken a toll on us. I need mothers to come and and just help us. I'm sorry. I just need Mothers to stand up for other mothers. And, to, you know, if we unite, we could say enough is enough. You framed our sons. You framed our daughters. And they need to be held accountable. And those who we look towards for help turn a blind eye. It's horrendous. It's heart-wrenching. And your hands are tied. The court's are not fair. They are not. They are pro-prosecution, and they look at them for truth and justice, and all they do is lie. They lie to the jury, they lie to the public, and they hide stuff for the conviction. There's something very not normal about that. Well, there's a power in numbers and your call there for mothers to come out and contribute to this and have their voice heard. That's that's how real change is made is when people assemble. So that's a that's a pretty honorable thing that you're putting the call out to do right now. Yes, we can be so much stronger united. 